Hi, my name is Josh. Today we're going to be doing a mini EBM on GI bleeding. The goal of this talk is not to go into a comprehensive or rigorous review of the data, but more to look at some of the seminal papers that help to define why we do what we do on a daily basis. Let's take a look. The first paper we're going to look at is a 2007 paper for New England Journal. Um, and what this paper did was look at patients who came in with suspected GI bleed and then randomize them either to placebo or IV PPI bolus plus infusion. It found that there was a lower need for procedural management um, in the IV PPI group, 19%, compared with 28% in the placebo group. It also found that if these patients did need to go for endoscopy, that there was a lower rate of bleeding ulcers and a higher rate of clean-based ulcers, both of which are favorable, favorable findings. When they looked at bleeding recurrence, need for surgery, or mortality, they found no benefit, and these findings were subsequently uh, confirmed in a Cochrane review of the data. In brief, though, this study showed why it's important to use IV PPIs leading up to potential endoscopy in upper GI bleeding. The next study we're going to look at, a New England Journal study from 2000, looked at IV PPIs following endoscopy. What they did is patients who came in with uh, bleeding peptic ulcers following endoscopy, they were subsequently randomized either to placebo or to IV PPI, which was a bolus of 80 milligrams followed by 8 milligrams per hour for 72 hours. Subsequently, both of these groups of patients were sent home on 20 milligrams of omeprazole daily. When they looked at 30-day rebleeding rates, they found that only 7% in the IV PPI group rebled, versus 23% in the placebo group. Notably, most of these rebleeds happened in the three days following endoscopy, which, as we heard, is when the IV PPI was still being infused. When they looked at need for surgery or 30-day mortality comparing the two groups, they found no difference. But this study helps to define why we use IV PPIs following endoscopy. Next, we're going to look at a study from The Lancet in 1995 that looks at a slightly different group of bleeding. This is uh, patients with cirrhosis who come in with esophageal variceal bleeding and subsequently get variceal ligation. This study subsequently, after the ligation, randomized patients either to placebo or to octreotide. And this was given uh, as a bolus of 50 micrograms, followed by 50 micrograms per hour times five days. They found um, that the rebleeding rate in the octreotide group was only 9%, compared with 38% in the placebo group. They also found that in the octreotide group, only one patient needed balloon tamponade for massive hematemesis and hemodynamic instability, whereas 10 patients in the placebo group required balloon tamponade. The study showed a trend towards reduction in in-hospital mortality and reduction in 30-day mortality in the octreotide group, but wasn't powered enough to, to fully confirm this. A subsequent meta-analysis that looked at this very question showed no difference between the two groups. But this is why we use octreotide uh, infusion in patients who have esophageal variceal bleeding after they get ligation. Next, we're going to take a look at a New England Journal paper from 2013. Um, and this looked at whether a conservative versus liberal transfusion strategy in upper GI bleeding was more effective. The conservative transfusion strategy only transfused if the hemoglobin went less than 7, whereas the liberal strategy transfused if it went less than 9. When they looked at the two groups at 6 weeks, they found that more patients in the conservative transfusion group were alive, 95% compared to 91%. Also, when they looked at certain subclass of GI bleeding patients, notably peptic ulcer bleeding, and uh, cirrhotic uh, esophageal variceal bleeding in child's class A and B patients, that it showed the same results, that there was better survival in the, uh, in the conservative transfusion group, hemoglobin less than 7. Additionally, when they looked at re-bleeding risk um, and risk of adverse event, it was actually lower in the conservative transfusion group. So together, this study suggested that conservative transfusion strategy in upper GI bleeding was more effective and confirmed so in a variety of subclasses. Finally, we'll take a look at this Annals paper from 2010. This was a non-inferiority study, and what they did was they looked at patients who came in on a baby aspirin, um, either for a cardiovascular or cerebrovascular indication, who had GI bleeding. Um, these patients underwent endoscopy and treatment with PPI, as we've discussed elsewhere. And then subsequent to that, were either immediately restarted on their aspirin they had come in on, or it started on placebo. When they looked at 30-day re-bleeding rate, 10% of patients in the aspirin, aspirin group rebled versus 5% in the placebo group. So this is not that surprising. But when they looked at eight-week mortality, and this is all-cause mortality, in the aspirin group there was only 1.3% mortality, 
versus the placebo group had 13% mortality. Possibly more interestingly, when they looked at a, a surrogate, a combined marker of cerebrovascular, cardiovascular, and GI mortality, they again found that the aspirin group had lower mortality, 1.3% versus 10.3%. And this is interesting because the cerebrovascular and cardiovascular is the type of mortality we're trying to prevent with the aspirin, and the GI mortality is the mortality we're trying to avoid with the aspirin. So this really gets at the crux of the question. In short, this shows that it's beneficial to restart patients who have an indication for aspirin on their aspirin following endoscopy for GI bleeding. So in summary, this is a brief review of some of the data behind GI bleeding and helps to guide our treatment decisions that we make on an everyday basis. Thanks for watching.